Welcome examiners, examinees and also the all postgraduates to the fifth pediatric endocrinology for postgraduates, a virtual teaching program. Last four sessions we have done very successfully. This time we have got uh, three professors. My professor Dr. Raghupati who is a convener of this program and uh, Professor Anna Simon Madam from the CMC Vellur and uh, Dr. G.V. Subramanian sir from Usmani Medical College and the expert and examiner Dr. Anurag Bajpai from Kanpur. We welcome you all. Now I request my professor Dr. Raghupati sir to start the session. Thank you sir. Good evening everybody. Uh, I am glad this session of uh, pediatric endocrinology for specifically postgraduates doing pediatric medicine is going on as I wished and desired in the past. Uh, you all know that uh, people who are training MD postgraduates in pediatrics or DNB pediatrics, uh, all the centers do not have somebody who can teach pediatric endocrinology. So the, the uh, candidates are always uh, afraid and constant fear regarding pediatric endocrinology questions and uh, cases in the practical exam. And uh, with the view to helping them, this program was uh, started. And uh, you may be knowing that um, parents also are always afraid of hormones. Hormones they think are bad. And uh, so if you suggest thyroxine therapy, they will be, you know, in two minds, whether they should continue lifelong and things like that, in spite of talking so much to them. And uh, similarly, I think the postgraduates also have some fear about endocrinology. And uh, the main essence of this program is to make the things easier, easier for you to understand and also to carry out. And also to realize the, the importance of endocrinology and uh, the wonders of endocrinology also. And uh, without much further ado, I think we should go on to the program. We have a busy program. And uh, uh, I would, one, only one thing I would like to add, we wish more participation from the postgraduate side those who are attending today, please go and tell them, uh, tell the others, your colleagues, to join this uh, program. We are going to have the next one in October and uh, to impress on them uh, how we are tackling all the aspects with regard to the exam. And we are even including an OSCE session today also. And uh, uh, I would make this request to you, to all of you, uh, to tell your colleagues to join this program. Uh, and also, you, you will be able to participate by presenting a case. And uh, that will be also a very good exercise for you. And uh, wish you all the very best for your exams and uh, also for this program. Uh, I'm very grateful to Amarnath was taken, you know, continuing interest for the whole year and uh, for holding this session without fail. Thank you, Amana. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much. So the real treasure is only our teachers and the knowledge. So knowledge, we have to learn each and every second from each and every patient. So we have to spend maximum time with the patient. With this, today we have got the first case that is the delayed puberty and Turner syndrome. The presentation is by Naga Geeta Rani from Sri Ramachandra Medical College, Chennai. The guide is Dr. Dibe Lakshmi. Uh, she is the mentor and also the guide for her. And the examiner will be Dr. Anurag Bajpai, sir, he is a well known pediatric endocrinologist, author for many textbooks, presented so many national, international papers. And also my professor, Dr. G.V. Subramaniam, sir, 
for general pediatrics say, from Usmane Medical College. Over to you, sir. Jeeva uh, Subramanian, sir, and uh, Anurag Bajpay, sir. Geeta, yes, you start yes, presenting. Sir. Sure, sir. So good evening, uh, one and all. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, starting with the case details, a 10 years old girl child, first born of non-consanguineous marriage, informant being mother and history reliable, was brought with chief complaints of poor height and weight gain in comparison to her peers from one to two years of age. History of present illness. The child has always been a thin and short child, always been the shortest in class, and the child poorly outgrows clothes, that is school uniform every year. Also been gaining weight poorly. Diet wise, she's a fussy eater and also takes small portion size. There is no history of polyuria or polydipsia or bony abnormalities. Recurrent respiratory tract infections or recurrent diarrhea. No history of weight loss, fever or loss of appetite. No history of constipation or cold intolerance or decline in scholastic performance. No history suggestive of raised intracranial pressure, no history of prolonged drug intake, and there's no history of appearance of secondary sexual characteristics. Past history was nil significant. Birth history, antenatally, mother was booked and immunized and was uneventful antenatal period, and mother had normal antenatal scans. Natal history, term 39 weeks gestation, delivered by normal vaginal delivery. Birth weight of the child was around 2.7 kgs and the child cried at birth. Postnatal history, no history of any NISO admission. Neonatal period was uneventful and the child was breastfed till one year of age. Family history, child is first born to a non-consanguineous marriage, single child. History of hypothyroidism was present in the mother and there was short stature in the father and paternal grandmother noticed. No history of delayed puberty in parents and there is no family history of tuberculosis. Developmental history, child attained age-appropriate milestones and has good scholastic performance. Dietary history, as per 24-hour recall method, the child had a calorie deficit of 10.6% and a protein deficit of 5%. Immunization history, child is immunized up to date and the child belongs to lower middle class three as per modified Kupusami classification. Summary based on history, 10 years girl child, poor height and weight gain from one to two years of age, no history suggestive of any chronic systemic illness, and there is family history of short stature and hypothyroidism. Child had normal developmental milestones and good scholastic performance. Okay, so you have got a very common uh, presentation of a 10 year old girl who has significant uh, growth decline from around one to two years of age. So what do you really imply from having a, a growth failure, which is onset not at birth, but after around one to two years? So which condition will you think of in this scenario? So uh, as per the uh, ICP growth model, initially, if, if it if the child presents before infancy, the nutrition would be the more probable cause. But in childhood, the hormones come into play, like growth hormone and the thyroid hormone come into play. So I think of hormonal causes more than nutritional causes. Sir. Okay, good. And uh, within hormonal causes, which cause is unlikely given your overall uh, clinical uh, description based on history? Which hormone is unlikely, sir? Which deficiency is unlikely in this scenario based upon your history? In fact, one of the points you've written here. And thyroid hormone is not likely, sir, because there's no history of any constipation or... Uh, yes, sir. Thyroid hormone deficiency is unlikely. So pretty much from your perspective, if you look at it, it being predominantly a childhood onset growth failure with a normal intellect, then growth hormone deficiency would be something which is coming up in the scale. Yes. Anything else you would think of? There can be familial short stages, sir, because the... There is family history of short stature. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to consider even familial short stature. Okay. So do you think about a familial short stature or a, uh, so you are saying that the predominantly the paternal side, the father and the paternal father. mother is affected. So do you think that would go in more in a familial short stature or would it point towards a particular genetic uh, etiology? More towards particular genetic etiology. 
But so both inherited yeah. are you looking at? In, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Inherited uh, short speech. Again. So which type of inheritance are you looking at? From the uh, family history, sir. Yeah, yeah. Dominant. So you have got three generations yes, which are affected. So you have to think of dominant. So I think you've done a very good summary. Uh, sir, your takes on this? Sir. Uh, audible? Hello? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Uh, so good evening, all. Uh, it is a nice presentation by you. But uh, I would like to seek some clarification. With regard to the natural details of this child, see the problem has started right from one year of age according to you. So the problem, uh, as you said, ICP model can be applied, but is that more often the childhood is mid-childhood where you can think of an endocrinopathy more often. But in Indian scenario, we come across very often children with low birth weight, especially hypoplastic small parditis, dates and other categories. So the birth weight, gestation, and how are the baby's other aspects you did not, I think, uh, you, you have not elaborated. If you can elaborate them, it will be much better. Because that may throw light. Suppose if it were to be a case of hypoplastic small for dead babies, you cannot have the same postnatal catch-up on par with peers. So therefore, uh, I, I go by epidemiological reasons. I go, I give due weightage. The most important determinant is the birth weight. And afterwards, how was the postnatal? So this, I, I, this also I wanted to consider in this particular case because the problem has started much earlier. So birth weight was 2.7 kg, I believe. Yeah. Yes, sir. Birth weight was 2.7 kg. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Term gestation. Hmm. Uh, child did not have any uh, midline facial defects or uh, since it's a girl child uh, um, and did not have any hypoglycemic, neonatal hypoglycemia events, anything like, sir, like that significant. What was the mode of delivery? Normal vaginal delivery, sir. It was uh, not a breach delivery. It was a cephalic presentation. So even a breach, no, uh, we can consider uh, growth hormone deficiency because it can be one of the predisposing mm -hmm. features. It was uh, a um, cephalic presentation, normal vaginal delivery. Geeta, can you think of any non-endocrine cause? You are telling again and again endocrine cause. Can you tell the short teacher? with non-endocrine cause which can present from uh, birth or one or two years. Syndromic, sir. Very good. Very good. What, what else? Something related to skeleton? Uh, muscular, I mean, sorry. Skeletal dysplasia, yes, sir. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Skeletal dysplasia. So, one pos positive history is there in your uh, uh, skeletal dysplasia related history. Can you tell that? In your family history, something is positive. Three generation, there is a fan, there is a short stature. Yes, sir. So what is the inheritance you think of? Dominant inheritance. Very good. Excellent. Uh, can, when you talk about nutrition, we talk about nutrition in the sense of food intake, but some other factors like malabsorption can also cause nutritional pattern of growth failure. Can you think of some uh, nutritional disorder which will present around from two years of age, let's say, like this case? Malab celiac disease or like that malabsorption syndrome, sir. So classically, because that's when the, the weaning and other things are done, so it typically starts from that age group. Yes. So that is something, at least in our part, we will be considering that as a strong possibility from our side. Yeah. I think you can uh, carry forward. Yes. So provisional diagnosis of familial short stature with can uh, have hypothyroidism to rule out chronic systemic illness. Coming to physical examination, child was alert and active. Vitals, pulse rate was 98 per minute. Blood pressure, 90 by 60 mm of mercury. Respiratory rate, 18 per minute. All peripheral pulses were well felt and see capillary refill was less than three seconds. No paler, no iterus, cyanosis or clubbing, no lymphadenopathy or pedal edema was present. Head to toe examination. The child had pectus carinatum with widely spaced nipples, with no goiter, with low posterior hairline and short fourth and fifth metacarpals and short fourth and fifth toes were present. Coming to anthropometry, 
height of the child is 113.2 centimeters when marked on iap 2015 uh, charts it falls less than third percentile and the child is proportionate weight of the child is 19.4 kg when marked in iap 2015 charts uh, falls less than third centile bmi of the child is 15.19 falls in uh, between 25th to 50th percentile as per iap 2015 charts so the father's height was 160 cm and mother's height 154.5 cm and the mid parental height which is marked uh, as a leftward facing arrow on the chart falls uh, on 150.7 cm and the target height ranges between 144.7 to 156.7 cm which is marked as upward and downward facing arrows in the chart smr staging the child was prepubertal and the child falls far below the mid parental height so what is your interpretation of this growth chart what does it tell you what pattern of growth failure is it so the child is very far less than the mid parental height yeah so you know, even not catching up somewhere with the both okay. the parents right so is can genetic one is she short for the population yes very short yes is she very short, short for the family you have said yes the catch there would be that sometimes what happens is that if you have one particular parent who is very short in this case short but not that short then you have to consider that this could be autosomal dominant inheritance the third factor would be what is more affected weight or height in this case height sir because it started from you know very chronic now the child is around 10 years old so we'll so what is the weight age and what is the height age in this child it falls at 6 years sir so both are the same same so what basically means that both are equally affected now what does it tell you is it a nutritional pattern or a endocrine pattern growth sir endocrine pattern sir nutritional mostly weight is affected when height is preserved so mm. endocrine pattern sir so i think if you you plotted the chart very nicely and it very clearly shows a pathological pattern of growth failure which is definitely much below the parental expectation which goes more with equal involvement of both height and weight suggesting a uh, yeah. endocrine pattern or a non nutritional let's put it this way non nutritional pattern of growth failure uh, uh, that's fine and what do you give the significance so to now, the breast and pubic sorry sir younger children i mean long standing nutritional deficit you might also get a bit but the uh, age group is of course older child right? Younger children, if you that uh, if the height is not affected, height also can be affected because of nutrition insert. Insert. The, yes, there can be a proportionate dwarf in a child who is suffering from chronic undernutrition. <clears throat> but of course, this will not this will not fit into that. I agree that. But in general, you are making a generalization that height is not affected in nutrition. No, uh, chronic insert. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. we cannot make sweeping generalizations huh? okay sir what is the significance of prebirth status at this point of time uh, presently in this child 10 years old the child will obviously be prebirth sir but if at all there is any uh, signs of secondary sexual characteristic development before at 10 years of age it compromises the like finer adult height of the child so mm -hmm. for that importance i just put it as prebirth sir Sure, sure. That's that's perfect. So I think your diagnosis is pretty evident based upon your previous slide. So um, do you have any other thing on examination? Or other systems you want to comment specifically? Uh, other systems were normal, sir. Cardiovascular system, S one, S two were normal. You know, added sounds are normal. Respiratory system, normal. Vesicular blood sounds were bilaterally. For abdomen, soft. No tenderness or no obvious palpable organomegaly. And central nervous system was also normal, sir. What was the blood pressure? Blood pressure was not falling uh, at around the ninetieth centile, so like ninety by sixty mm of Hg, right arm supine position. You didn't measure blood pressure in other limbs. All four limbs were measured, sir. Nearly normal. No. So you uh, should change. mention that because that's a very specific sure, sir. point yes, sir. in this sure, case. Sir. Why did you measure in all four limbs? Do you measure in everybody? No, sir. When we suspect uh, any cardiac issues or then we will measure all the limbs so i think that is a very very relevant point that if you have a short girl who has got all these stigmata which are clearly leading to a syndrome that's yes, why sir. you have done all the four limbs and that would be a positive thing if you put for right away 
rather than waiting for being asked. So that will give you more relevance in that perspective. Yeah. Sure. So sir. That blood pressure and, and coarctation becomes a very, very important uh, parameter to look at from that perspective. Sure, sir. Uh, yeah, Geeta, Geeta, one point here uh, yes. in general physical examination, you said uh, multiple knee Can you tell what are the causes of multiple knee with short stitches? Not sure, sir. You have shown, no? Knee oh, oh, uh, Turner syndrome, I have known, sir. Other causes, sir. Yeah. Can you tell uh, short stitcher with capulate spots? Fanconis anemia. What else? An indication for growth hormone. Child has triangular faces, phenodactyly, hemiatrophy. Start with R. Childhood hypoglycemia. Russell Silver. Russell Silver. Very good. Very good. So, Kefalit's part can present even in Turner syndrome also. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, Russell Silver syndrome. Very good. I think they, it should be more in a detailed manner, not a passing mention. Sure. Anurag, uh, with your permission, may I make one point? Uh, definitely, sir. Please, sir. And uh, uh, Geeta, can you show the clinical picture? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this as pectus carinatum. Yes, sir. Which is not right. And uh, this is a common deformity which will be kept in the exam in a patient with uh, rickets. Yes. And you can't call this pectus carinatum. Okay. Pectus carinatum is also known as pigeon chest. Pigeon chest. Yes. Do you think this is pigeon chest? This is pectus carinatum. There is a depression. Excavator. Excavatum, you should say. I don't want people to go away thinking that this is carinatum and uh, this is for you and for all the postgraduates. The funnel chest with the depression of the sternum, lower half of the sternum is depressed. And okay. that can, uh, mind you, that can cause displacement of clinical displacement of apical impulse also. So yes. I think it would be more prudent on your part to make a detailed mention of cardiovascular. <clears throat> okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, go ahead. So summary uh, following examination, 10 years girl child, short stature from one to two years of age with poor weight gain, family history of short stature and hypothyroidism with normal developmental milestones and scholastic performance with stigma of Turner syndrome without goiter and sexual maturity rating prepubertal with a provisional diagnosis of short stature and underweight and Turner syndrome. May I intervene? Because I want to clarify. Yeah, uh, thank you, Divya. Divya Lakshmi is associate professor from uh, Sri Ramachandra Medical College, uh, who has provided the case immediately. Thank you, Divya. Please go ahead. Uh, no, actually, she had pectus carinatum, this uh, bulge that was very prominent. Uh, but I think in photo, it, uh, it is looking like uh, the child is having pectus excavator because following that bulge, she had that depression uh, as well. So. I think, uh, can we interpret this way? The upper half being more prominent and lower half yes. being depressed. Yeah. Yeah. Upper half looking into it is uh, something labeled as pectus uh, carinatum, but yeah. lower half looking like a funnel chest. Sometimes the angulation may be acute and may give an impression. But all the attendance, some chest scale deformity she has to refer to and classically describe what exactly is the defect that is there. That would be more uh, a clear description. Huh? So, uh, label, assigning a label is one aspect. But more importantly, the description. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one more point to Navagita. Can you tell what is the nail finding of Turner syndrome? Nail Hyper finding. Convex. Hyper convex. Very nails. good. Very good.
coming to the investigations of the child, complete blood picture showed normal hemoglobin 13 grams per deciliter with normal white blood cells and platelets. Thyroid stimulating hormone was 2.69 microinternational units per ml and free T4 1.27 nanograms per deciliter, which were normal in range. Serum creatinine was 0.6 mg per deciliter. Liver function tests were normal, total bilirubin 0.3. Transaminases were normal with normal total protein of 7.6 grams. Follicle stimulating hormone was 162 milli international units per ml and luteinizing hormone was 70 milli international units per ml, which were high. And estradiol was undetectable, less than 5 picograms per ml, pointing towards hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Lipid profile was normal. PTG IgA was negative. So just hold on. So if you look at this point of time, what is your diagnosis from here? Hypogonadotropic, uh, hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, sir, because both FSH and LH were elevated and estradiol was undetectable. Otherwise, thyroid function tests were normal. And, In a uh, short even, girl with uh, all the classical features, your diagnosis would be turn turn us in, turn, turn us in. Now, um, as the devil's advocate, I ask you, why would you do any further investigation like karyotype? So do you think this girl requires a karyotype from here or your diagnosis is made and you can start treatment uh, from here? We can start treatment, sir. But so for she confirmation, has classical clinical feature. She is yes, short. Sir. She has stigmata and FSH is high. So what I'm trying to say is that is uh, somebody saying karyotype is a very expensive test. I don't want to do a karyotype. Do you agree or you say no karyotype has to be done? And if yes, why? For confirmation of diagnosis, yes, sir. We can do it. Too. Diagnosis is from my clinical perspective confirmed. Anything else? What is the very important role of karyotype in Turner syndrome besides confirming the diagnosis? Can it change the management somehow? In the sense that you may have to do some surgical intervention. In fact, all there is, uh, you know, mosaicisms there or any Y chromosomes I like that, sir. You mean to say like, y y, but if at all there's a Y, we need yeah. to do a surgical intervention and remove the gonads because uh, gonadoblastoma is more wrong. Yeah. So that's why karyotype is absolutely essential. Okay. So even if somebody says that, okay, I don't want to spend money to do a karyotype, you have to say, no, it has to be done because I want to rule out a Y-cell. Y-cell, yes. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Bone age of the child as per GP atlas was 8.5 years. Echocardiogram done was normal with no abnormality. Ultrasound abdomen showed uterus size of 3.4 into 1.2 into 1 centimeters and endometrial thickness was 2.1 mm. Right and left ovaries were 13 into 8 mm and uh, kidney, ureter, bladder were normal. Karyotyping was done with uh, re which revealed abnormal female chromosome complement in all cells with a single X chromosome showing 45 X in 30 cells. Diagnosis of Turner syndrome. Management, we started the child on growth hormone since 2019 June, uh, which was provided from the government hospital. Growth hormone dose was 0.1 units per kg per day. We have given 0.23 uh, mg per kg per week approximately for the child. And follow up, presently the child is 13 years old with the height of 129.7 centimeters and weight of 28.5 kgs. And the child uh, grew 16.5 centimeters in 32 months, 8.5 centimeters in first 18 months and uh, 8 centimeters in the next 14 months. This was due to the non-availability of growth hormone during uh, the pandemic period. But uh, post lockdown, the compliance seems good. Current growth hormone dose uh, for the child is 0.16 units per kg per day, around uh, 0.37 mg per kg per week. Still, the child is prepubertal. And bone age is uh, 11 years uh, for a chronological age of 13 years as of now. Uh, following up with the thyroid function tests, which were normal. And the child was started on calcium and vitamin D supplements. Insulin like growth factor 1 and TTG were not done due to logistic reasons. And child was planned to start on low dose estrogen supplementation. Thank you. Sir. So do you need to do a growth hormone testing in this child before you start growth hormone? Not necessarily. So we can directly start the child on growth hormone. Sir. And how is the dose, uh, it may be a bit more for you, but how is the dose different uh, for Turner as compared to growth hormone deficiency? Do you need I, a higher dose or a lower dose? 
we can start initially with the normal prescribed dose sir but if at all it is not not uh, catching up we can increase double the times when compared to a normal growth hormone so just a small, just a small comment that uh, probably we could have started at a higher dose the initial dose was around 33 microgram per kg per day i think 0.1 units yes sir. probably if we start by 45 to 50 that would be the recommended dose per turn yes. because they require a bit more and that's what you are probably getting in that initial growth velocity was a bit less then once the dose was increased the response is better on that but by that's beyond this case discussion from a post graduate perspective that's that's fine thank you very much uh, dr geeta uh, just one small question uh, yes, any special growth charts you know about this condition yes sir there are uh, special growth charts for few syndromes like turner syndrome also has a special growth chart and there are also other special growth charts for turner are you aware of uh, indian specific turner growth chart yes sir very good thank you thank you sir. thank you very much uh, both one, one, one person one person to the student Uh, yes. In this particular case, the both midparental height is quite low, uh, and uh, the child is lagging quite behind. Is it not? So yes. there is a possibility of a, a familial component also in this particular case. You said the growth hormone assessment is not uh, needed initially. Straight away you embark upon growth hormone, of course, which may be a bit costly also. But uh, what? How do you justify yourself? if there is associated growth hormone deficiency as uh, sar said it may require larger doses so yeah, can we come to a conclusion that the child doesn't have any growth hormone issues based on parental height or you want to have a check before is my question before we embark upon no? we are uh, like since the child had stigmata we are not suspecting isolated growth hormone deficiency sir that no no, no. isolated is isolated is not the point ah okay ah right isolated growth hormone we are not suspecting the for the stigmata because the stigmata so ah. in this child uh, we go went ahead with growth hormone directly sir but if at all we are suspecting a short for I mean, not falling in the sentence of mid parental height then we definitely need to do a growth hormone stimulation test and then uh, confirm it and then provide growth hormone for the child i think the answer to your question the question also already is there in what you were discussing that since this is more of a pharmacological treatment uh, even if the growth hormone is low or normal turner syndrome itself becomes an indication so that is not going to change your management dramatically that's why we don't routinely measure but okay, of course sir. if a turner girl is deviating significantly from the turner's chart then you have to think of alternate okay, diagnosis in that scenario and that's a very very important question in that regard so uh, but in this case there's a classical turner you have diagnosed based upon karyotype and uh, she is not she is pretty much fitting into the turner's growth chart if i look at it from that perspective so we don't expect additional pathology they usually are 20 cm below the expected height so that is a reasonable to start treatment and growth hormone stimulation would not be required in that scenario in that perspective but definitely as uh, sir said that if there is a significant deviation the possibility of a associated etiology also becomes important in that uh, regard sir okay sir thank you sir thank you very much sir uh, uh, dr anurag uh i mean um, dr geeta yes sir yes sir uh, it's it's uh, good growth actually 8.5 cm in uh, first 18 months okay that's 18 months not one year uh, i think the compliance was poor if you see the growth chart there is no increment in the height right yes, it has not jumped up like how you give a growth hormone yes ma'am because your dose is quite less okay. turner syndrome the dose should be much more much than more. what you are given here yes ma'am later dose are better so if you see last dr shaila the last dose is touching around 50 so initial dose was definitely 30 35 so that's why there is It's a written the current dose is uh, current dose for the child is 0.37 mg per kg per week is fine ma'am so that's like 50 microgram per kg per day yeah It that's is... a good dose yeah so if the compliance is good i think she should have little bit more increased that is one thing and it's if they can take growth hormone i think igf should always be done 
if you are planning to increase the dose yes, or the growth yes. velocity is not good you mm -hmm. can't jump and give a very much higher dose so igf measurement should be mandatory in this kind of conditions when you, when you are targeting a higher dose for better response so that would be sure. two things okay. and definitely excluding other secondary causes like follow up thyroid and celiac on follow up as well which is uh, there too yeah i think uh, those two things have to be done even the ttga even though i know they may be a south indian or tamilian mm -hmm. we do see a lot of patients uh, who are not north indians so and if there is a turner syndrome other autoimmune conditions are more likely so cortisol thyroid ttga with total iga should be done yes ma'am Uh, we thank uh, Dr. Shaila Bhattacharya, Madam. She is a professor of uh, pediatric endocrinology from Manipal Hospital and uh, from Davangiri. She is our president, uh, very dynamic president. Thank you very much for joining, Madam. Now we request Anurag sir to uh, give lecture on because, uh, delayed puberty and Turner syndrome. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Amarnath, for this kind invitation. And uh, for uh, inviting me for this very, very interesting aspect. So what I'll do over the next 20 minutes or so is to cover the relevant aspects of uh, delayed puberty, both in terms of uh, uh, boys and girls. And this is a very, very wide and diverse uh, field in which we need to be very careful in terms of evaluation and management. And uh, this is very relevant because our short stature delayed puberty may also be a sign of a underlying disease which may have significant pathological connotations as well. So if you're dealing with a child who has delayed puberty, you need to be aware that there could be other disorders which are also there in that regards. Similarly, a lot of these are physiological. So we need to be careful that we do not unnecessarily label them as pathology. So I'll start with a 13 year old girl with concern for delayed puberty, who was brought by parents with a stage one breast development and stage one pubic hair development. She was short for that particular height, weight was reasonably all right. And the workup had shown our LH and FSH levels were low. Uh, ultrasound had been done which showed an absent uterus. Now this seems to be a very devastating diagnosis because parents are really concerned about delayed puberty. And what you're finding is that there are no uterus which is found on ultrasound. Now, why are we do, what is the problem occurring in this scenario? So what we need to understand is that this is just at the time when we start thinking about delayed puberty in girls. And if you do not have any breast development, which basically means that you don't have any estrogen exposure, you are expected to have a very, very small hypoplastic uterus, which may actually be missed on uh, uh, ultrasound by radiologists. And that could be labeled as a quote unquote absent uterus. So this was a case wherein a unnecessary workup was done and a child was labeled as significant pathology. So this is something which we need to really avoid. On the contrary, we have the 16 year old boy who again presented with pubertal concern. Onset was at the age of 13 years and there was no development for the last two years. Had a small testicular volume, which was soft stage three pubic hair. Height was 170 centimeters. So tall in that perspective, diagnosed as CDGP. Now, when I'm going to talk about what really is not CDGP is somebody who is tall, somebody who has got good pubic hair development, somebody who had onset and then has tall. So this child had everything which was again CDGP, but yes, was labeled CDGP based upon a low level of gonadotrophins. And when we got the MRI done, it showed a large tumor. So what we need to understand is that delayed puberty is a common presentation. Boys with delayed puberty are more likely to present as compared to girls, but the chance of pathological cause is higher in girls. Still, one third of girls will have a physiological cause, while a significant pathology will be in around 30% and 30% will have a systemic disorder or a functional cause. As far as boys are concerned, 70 to 80% will be <coughs> physiological. There will be disorders in around 30%. So the main role of a, a pediatrician is to really identify the physiological cause as in the first case and not to miss the pathological cause as in the second case because that's where we have to be cautious in terms of timely evaluation and management and that becomes absolutely essential.
the courses which are available can also be accessed. So we'll talk about delayed puberty a bit, about etiology, why is there delayed puberty, how to evaluate and how to manage. And since it's only 15, 20 minutes, I'll focus predominantly to give a holistic approach in that perspective, instead of going into very specifics on that regard, you can refer to other resources on the web and the website, which you can evaluate from there. Now, when we talk about uh, puberty, we understand that there are three major organs, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the gonads, which interact with each other. And there are three major hormones, the GnRH coming from the hypothalamus, which is the primary driver of pubertal onset, the gonadotrophins from the puberty, the LH and FSH, LH being a major player in boys and FSH being the major player in girls, while both are required in concert in both genders and the ovaries and testes, which produce finally the sex hormones. Now, the problems could either be at the level of the hypothalamus or the pituitary in what is known as hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, characterized by low levels of gonadotrophins, which will include a combination of genetic causes. Most common of them would be isolated defects in GnRH migration. Now, we all know that GnRH neurons migrate from the olfactory placode near the nose, to the pituitary region, the, the hypothalamic region, and along with them come the sense neuron, the olfactory neuron. And therefore, abnormalities in puberty are often associated with anosmia. And that is one thing you should always ask as far as history is concerned. There could also be a combined hypothalamic pituitary defect in which you have multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. There could be an acquired cause in which you may have a normal development and then suddenly something happened just like the second case, which could be in the form of a trauma, radiation, infection or a tumor. So a situation in which you have a stalled puberty is a sign of a pathological cause which you have to be really worried about in that regard. There could also be infiltrative disorders and very importantly, especially in girls, any condition which is affecting the nutrition any form of stress, calorie deprivation, systemic illness will also cause the pituitary to shut down and you will have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So before you label somebody as isolated hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, exclude all the chronic systemic causes as you do for, for short stature, renal disorder, liver disease, uh, malabsorption, renal tubular acidosis, hyperprolaxinemia, and an insult, and then only go for an idiopathic cause in that perspective. The second group of disorders can be the ones in which the gonads are affected, in which you have got hypergonadotropic or a high FSH level. Remember, FSH elevation is the best marker of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. And in this case, the FSH was more than 100, if you recall uh, the presentation recently. The problems could be at the level of the gonadal development. Most common causes will be Turner syndrome, as was the case discussed just before, and Klinefelter syndrome in boys. Now, Klinefelter syndrome is an interesting finding in which you will have some initial development and then there will be a regression. So, testicular volume will go up to around 10 ml and then there would be regression of testis. There would be some amount of pubic hair. There will be gynecomastia. So, Klinefelter syndrome, if you talk about the truest sense of the word, is a stalled puberty and not a classical delayed puberty from that perspective. But again, in boys, if your FSH is high, think Klinefelter syndrome. There could also be rare cases of gonadal dysgenesis, which can also cause delayed puberty, particularly in a female phenotype, where you will find that abnormalities in the synthesis of uh, steroids, testosterone, and estrogen can cause a combined adrenal or a isolated gonadal defect in that perspective. There could also be an insult of the gonads due to infection, drugs, radiation, or infiltration because of autoimmune cause particularly relevant in the girls, which causes premature ovarian insufficiency. So we need to understand that when we talk about uh, delayed puberty, we are talking about either a problem in the hypothalamus or pituitary, which is a permanent problem, or because of the environment, which is a functional problem, or a primary gonad problem in that perspective. So delayed puberty can mostly be physiological, as I said, 70 to 80% in boys, one third in girls is physiological and the term now is self-limited delayed puberty. This condition is characterized by slow growth. So everything is shut down, growth is less, there is no pubarchy. There could be a pathological cause, of course, in around 60 to 70 percent of girls and around 30 percent of boys. Within this, you can have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, 
where the FSH level is low, it can be congenital right from birth. And if you have a boy with micro penis and delayed puberty, always think of a congenital cause. Or if you have a midline defect, cleft lip, cleft palate, hypoglycemia, neonatal cholestasis, this could be a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. There could be acquired causes like tumor, infiltration or insult, which will of course have a neurological features, just like the second case. Now, often we tend to miss them and we say everything is physiological and we will miss this cause in that perspective. Very important, any chronic systemic illness which causes stress and calorie deprivation will also cause hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. These individuals will be sick in that perspective. Now, if you go to the other arm, if your gonadotrophins are high, FSH is high, you are dealing with a gonadal problem, which could be a dysgenesis, classically Turner's and Kleinfelter's in most scenarios. You will have stigmata, like we discussed here, brachymetacarpia, hyperconvex nail, uh, you will have multiple nevi, webbing of neck. In boys, you will have gynecomastia, tall stature, large legs, increased arm span. That is a typical characteristic of Kleinfelter syndrome, which will be there. Synthetic defects in which you will have other features. So if you have a salt wasting with a female appearance, you're dealing with a very, very proximal defects. If you have hypertension and sexual infantilism, you're dealing with 17 hydroxylase deficiency. And finally, if you have an acquired cause, most likely in girls will be an autoimmune etiology. In boys, you can have a testicular torsion. If it's bilateral only, there will be an effect in that perspective. So most cases are physiological, but you need to understand when to think of pathology in that perspective. So three questions which are very, very important. Is it delayed puberty? Is it pathological or physiological? Is it hypogonadotropic or hypergonadotropic? And finally, what's the cause? So the definition of delayed puberty in girls is absence of thelarchy by three years or no menarche within four years of thelarchy. So as discussed, the first case, 13 year was just a borderline scenario. In boys, no testicular enlargement by 14 years, or if there is a stall development, development and then it stopped. And very importantly, no role of pubic hair or penile length in the assessment of delayed puberty in boys. So as discussed in the first case, we had this 13 year old girl with concern for delayed puberty. It was too early for evaluate. Best would have been to wait and watch and what havoc was caused by this because parents were convinced that this is absent uterus, going to be a lot of problems, MRI and a lot of things. So don't unnecessarily over evaluate in that perspective. Now this eight year old boy with small phallus concerned about micro penis, very common presentation, but this child is obese and this happened to have a buried penis. So first of all, penile size is not relevant in diagnosing delayed puberty. Number two, whenever you're measuring penile size, do a stretched penile length and you will find a normal growth in that perspective. The next question is pathological versus physiological. So I would say the term is very simple. When you say constitutional delay of puberty and growth, you are talking about delay in both puberty and growth. So height should be less. Second, if you are having no gonadarchy, your testis and ovaries are not working, your adrenals should also be sleeping. So you will have no adrenarchy and because adrenals cause pubic hair development, you should theoretically have no pubic hair development. Bone age should be delayed. The problem is in onset. So once the onset happens, you will not have a stalled puberty in that perspective. So if you have retarded growth, bone age, absent pubic hair, and a slightly bigger testicular volume, especially in boys, we are most likely dealing with a constitutional delay of puberty and growth. On the contrary, if you have a tall child with a normal bone age, with a normal pubic hair, it goes more in favor of an isolated hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. There are various tests which are done to differentiate the two. There are no best way. The best way is to actually follow them up till 18 years and see whether they have a normal development or not. But tests which I find helpful in my scenario is a GNRS stimulated LH level more than five, a inhibin level more than 35 if a testicular volume is around one ml and a basal testosterone more than 20. So you can have an idea based upon doing this test to differentiate CDGP from a permanent hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in that regards. Now, what are the clinical pointers? As I said, delayed growth, absence of puba, 
absent and delayed bone it suggests a self limited form of delayed puberty on the contrary if you have puberty which means adenarche has happened so why is gonadarche sleeping stalled puberty second case if you remember initial puberty and then stop this is a sinister sign normal growth why is the child not growing in puberty not happening and of course if there is history of micro penis that suggests a antenatal origin in that regards similarly if there is midline defect like cleft lip cleft palate if there are neurological features if there is synkinesia or other features of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism like anosmia start thinking of a permanent cause so this becomes very very important when you examine the child for the first time in that regards so 14 year old boy with delayed puberty testicular volume is 3 ml just below 4 ml so not uh, really that much delayed i would say we also find that there is no pubic hair development the child looks to be short there is growth retardation bone age is delayed so now we are dealing with predominantly what looks like a constitutional delay of puberty and growth the other differential here will be a chronic systemic illness but there the child will be more sick in that perspective and when we did evaluation we found that there was a normal pubertal response so this is a classical case of cdgp delayed growth delayed gonadarche delayed puberty and the bone age is also delayed so you don't need to do much wait watch and observe the child will grow subsequently now what about 16 year old boy this is another child who had a onset at 13 years stopped for 2 years and this is what we discuss there is a height which is good there is pubic hair development so there are all the markers which are against the diagnosis of constitutional delay yet labeled at cdgp so this child had puberty he had stall development he had normal growth so this means there is a acquired cause of delayed puberty and clearly found to be a large craniopharyngioma so while 70 to 80% of boys will have a physiological cause if they are tall if they have neurological features if they have pubic hair development if there is a stall puberty do mri if the lhf which is low don't wait and watch in that perspective now once we know it's pathological the next question is hypo versus hyper the answer is very easy look at fsh when you're looking at precocious puberty as dr anna will talk about you have to look at lh being a bit of predominant marker here you look at fsh and fsh levels are really high in girls especially the fsh will be above 60 to 100 because there is no inhibin d in boys also the lh will be, fsh will be like 20 30 so you won't have any confusion between a hypogonadotropic versus a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism in that scenario so 17 year old boy with pubertal concern onset at 12 years stopped for 3 years Now this is significant. This cannot be CDGP because there is a stalled puberty which has happened. Testis is two ml. It's firm and there is gynecomastia. So I've already given three big clues: stalled puberty, firm testis, gynecomastia. Height is tall, so this is all the thing written up there. This is a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism because of Klinefelter syndrome, which you have to be very very wary about and evaluate from that perspective. Finally, we have to look at the cause, and there start with clinical evaluation. I found pubic hair very, very relevant. If you have no breast development but pubic hair is there, which means puberty has happened, this is most likely a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. If there is no breast development, no pubic hair development, this is classically a constitutional delay of puberty and growth. It can also be a manifestation of a sick child. rarely a child with multiple pituitary hormone deficiency where your acth is also knocked out will have no breast no pubic hair if on the other hand you have a large breast development but there is primary amenorrhea there is very sparse pubic hair this is interesting this suggests that there is a androgen insensitivity syndrome and finally if you have got normal puberty normal breast development but no periods this is suggestive of a local cause a malformation like cervical or mullerian agenesis in that regards so look at pubic hair look at breasts 90% of cases your diagnosis will be made in that perspective what about boys the most important thing to look at in a boy with delayed puberty is the testicular volume so if you have a large testis with delayed puberty this is interesting this is basically hypothyroidism where uncontrollably high tsh causes fsh elevation and macroorchidism but ladic cells are sleeping so you will have delayed puberty rare but interesting 
If you have very small and soft 1 ml testes, this is Kalaman syndrome. Ask for anosmia. You will get the history. If you have an intermediate 3 ml, something like that testis, you're dealing with constitutional delay. If you had a history of bigger testes, which have now become small and firm, just like the fifth case, which we discussed, this is Klinefelter syndrome classically. And of course, you can have anarchia or a DSD also, which can present in which you have no gonad. Polydactyly to look for Lawrence von Boodle syndrome, hearing defect with delayed puberty, think of Turner syndrome, charge and pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Brachymetacarpia is very nicely showed in this case, Turner syndrome. If you have short stature, Turner syndrome and multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, look for blood pressure, again reiterated in the first case, Turner syndrome and sexual infantilism with severe hypertension, hypokalemic alkalosis, that 17 hydroxylase deficiency. Now, just to summarize the approach, first of all, start with screening tests, CBC, liver function, renal function, celiac, thyroid, and look at prolactin also. If your gonadotrophins is low in a girl, you can go for a GnRH agonist and an MRI. If your gonadotrophins are high, look for karyotype to identify Turner syndrome. If it's a normal karyotype, then it becomes a bit difficult. You can think of a genetic workup. You can think of other rarer possibilities from there. And if it's XY rarely, it means that there is definitely a scenario of an XY disorder of sexual development. So your FSH levels, like in this case, will guide your evaluation. In the case discussed with us, the FSH was very high, karyotype was XO, so this was Turner syndrome classically in that scenario. What about boys? Again, do the basic screening test. If gonadotrophins is high, this is most likely Klinefelter syndrome. Do a karyotype. If the gonadotrophins are low, you are either dealing with constitutional delay of puberty in growth or hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So if you have anosmia, synkinasia, micropenis, CNS features, you can probably go for MRI directly. Otherwise, if the testosterone is above 20, this is basically going towards CDGP. If it's below 20, look at LH. If LH is more than 0.2, it again goes towards uh, a CDGP. If it's low and stimulated is above 5, this is CDGP. Otherwise, it's permanent HH. So evaluation based upon how much is your gonadotrophin levels, then look at testosterone and LH. You will get the diagnosis in most cases. This is a simplistic approach. We also now use inhibin B as a good marker of Sertoli cell function, which gives us a very, very good results in that perspective. We have also developed a puberty interpreter and we have validated it using very, very basic tools. So all the user has to do in our mobile application is to enter the basic details about the breast and the pubic hair development in girls and testicular volume. And they will get a right information about the precocious and delayed puberty. And we have found it to have a 97.8% concordance with clinical diagnosis. So this is something you can use very easy to interpret in that regards. So 12-year-old girl with growth failure already discussed in this case today, short, no breast development, no pubic hair development, brachymetacarpia and webbing, all the classical features, FSH high, advised growth hormone, but somebody forgot to do a karyotype, presented three years later with an abdominal lump, very important message, every girl with, even if you have 100% diagnosis of Turner syndrome clinically and high FSH, get a 30 cell metaphase karyotype done because you can't miss Y cell line. Otherwise, there will be gonadoblastoma, which will happen in that perspective. 16-year-old girl with delayed puberty, stage one breast development, no pubic hair. So again, no pubic hair suggests either CDGP or systemic illness. Now, this child is short, weight is also less, LH and FSH both are low. So is it hypogonadotropic hypogonadism? Advised for MRI. Now, if you look at basically the evaluation and enter the parameters, this looks like a recommendation for systemic illness. There is anemia, there is clubbing. So this turned out to be celiac disease. So before you label other rarer disorders, look at common conditions first in that regards. 14-year-old girl with delayed puberty, again, short and plump. Short and plump, always think of an endocrine cause. And what we found here was the gonadotrophin was slightly high, not as high as Turner's. There was also a karyotype was normal. There was deafness and brachymetacarpia. 
So here we are dealing with pseudo hypoparathyroidism, other possibility. So other possibilities are also relevant from that regards. 14 and a half year old girl with delayed puberty, no breast development, pubic hair stage one. And what we're seeing here is that gonadotropin levels are very high. So this is a hyper gonadotropic hypogonadism. One thing you should always do in this girl is to check blood pressure. If the blood pressure is very high, you get the diagnosis. So what we found here, karyotype was normal, blood pressure was very high, turn out to be a 17 hydroxys deficiency. So if you look at careful parameters, look at deafness, look at blood pressure, look at anosmia, you will get a lot of diagnosis right in that regards. How do you manage? Uh, very briefly, so if you have a boy who is beyond 14 years of age and you have got low LH, give a course of testosterone 100 milligrams for three doses every month. If there is a response, this is CDGP. If there is no response, you can repeat a course for three months. Response again, it is CDGP in most cases. If there is no response or the testosterone levels remains low, think of a permanent hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So the gold standard for diagnosing CDGP is the clinical response and response to testosterone. We always start with a low dose, 50 to 100 milligrams, and then build up the adult doses gradually over two to two and a half years. There are other long-acting preparations available for maintenance and gel and oral preparations are not recommended in children. There is a chance of fertility in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism using HCG and HNG and donor insemination can be used in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. In girls, the recommendation is to start off at a very low dose of approximately 10% of the adult dose, try to build it over two and a half years. We tend to prefer estradiol valerate and transdermal is of course more physiological, but it is difficultly less available. Progesterone is added only after minimum of two years of estrogen to allow breast and uterine growth, or if the bleeding has happened or the endometrial thickness is more than five mm. So a slow, gradual pubertal induction is what we look at. If you have a delayed diagnosis of Turner syndrome, we have to be slow and cautious in that perspective. So all of you can go and have a look at our website, which has got a lot of courses available, including fellowship and postgraduate courses as well, and the applications which are there. We routinely have multiple grand rounds, both for the pediatric endocrine fellows, for pediatricians, as well as a PG lecture series, which we run monthly, in which we aim to cover 36 topics over the next three years. We already had around six presentations there. So all of you can have a look there as well. Once again, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Amarnath, Dr. Dhrupati, and the entire team for the wonderful uh, opportunity and interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Sir is a very dynamic uh, teacher. He wrote and authored a textbook of pediatric endocrinology during his PG period in AIMS. So we should learn a lot of things from him. Uh, we need your blessing, sir. I thank uh, uh, sir for giving very brief and extensive workup and very short and simple diagnosis. Just by doing uh, this general physical examination, you can diagnose any condition. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to the next session. Uh, any comments from uh, Shaila Madam, Raghupati sir, Subramandam sir? We thank Jiva Lakshmi and Nagagita for excellent case. Now we'll move on to the next session on ASCII of pediatrics, uh, mainly on puberty. So most of the things covered uh, delayed puberty by uh, Anurag sir. Thank you. Over to Dr. Soundaram. Dr. Soundaram is a consultant pediatric endocrinologist, Apollo Hospital, Chennai, and also Apollo Proton Cancer Center, Chennai. And uh, we thank Soundaram uh, for readily accepting as a teacher and also giving the second case, that is precautious puberty from Apollo Chennai Hospital. Thank you. Over to you, Soundaram. So this is an OSCE session. Uh, we give five to 10 seconds time to interact with the postgraduates, we will be looking into chart box. So you can answer all the answers in the chart box. Thank you. A very good evening to all the professors and uh, postgraduates. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Amarnath for giving me this opportunity today. So let's go into the OSCE. So this is the first question. Uh, so identify the breast age. So all of you are aware of the Tanner's uh, sexual maturity rating. So I would like you to answer what breast age this is. Okay. 
Okay, so you have to remember that there are five stages of uh, breast development. So you have to remember it like a sequence. So B1 means it is absolutely flat and B2 means only the areolar enlargement and the papillary elevation is there. So the first step is just areolar enlargement with papillary elevation. And the third stage is the breast mound is being uh, formed. So uh, there is an elevation from the chest wall. So that is B3. Now, if you see this breast, the... Uh, areola is forming a secondary mound over the breast. So this is B4. Okay, and B5 means just like this, but there will not be any contour separation between the areola and the rest of the breast tissue. That is breast 5. So this is stage 4. Okay, so going on to the next question. So can you tell me what stage of pubic hair development is this? Yes, all of you answer. Stage 3, someone saying. Okay. So actually, I am not able to see the chat results for this question. Yeah, I will be yeah. telling. Yeah. Okay, sir. Stage so 3. Actually, yeah. So the second question says, when will the pubic hair start to curl? So this <coughs> also has a sequence, you can just remember. P1 means there is no hair at all. Sometimes very fine, straight hair can be there from infancy itself. That is called as vellus hair. So that you should not classify as uh, mature pubic hair. So just ask the mom if there is a fine uh, straight hair on the pubic area right from infancy, then that also becomes P1 only. In P2 also there will be straight hair, but little bit longer. You can compare with the forearm hair. If it is longer and lighter, then it becomes P2. And in stage three only the pubic hair will start to curl. Okay, so that answers the second question. So it will start to curl in P3. And the third question is identify the pubic hair stage. So here you can see that in P3, when the hair starts to curl, it is mainly around the scrotum and in the symphysis pubis area that it will be seen. In stage four, it will uh, occupy the entire uh, external genitalia, the entire uh, pubic area. So this is P4. In P5, what will happen is that the adjacent groin, the inner aspect of the thigh also will have pubic hair. So this one is P4. So when will uh, the growth spot happen in girls? In which breast stage does growth spot happen in girls? Okay, so Yogavani has told stage 2 to 3, that is right. So, girls will have a very early growth spot in the early stages of pubertal development. So, in which stage does uh, boy uh, do boys get their growth spot? Yeah, that's right. So, stage 3 to 4. So, uh, boys will have a later growth spot and also a more increase, a more growth velocity during the pubertal years. So the girls will grow like 8 to 10 centimeter per year for two years or so, whereas the boys will grow 10 to 12 centimeter per year and they have a delayed uh, growth spurt. I mean, delayed means uh, comparatively the stage, the tanner stage is late. So stage three to four, they will have a growth spurt and it will be more prolonged. So that's why the adult height difference is there of 13 centimeter between the boys and girls because of the delayed onset of the pubertal growth spot as well as the more increase in the pubertal uh, growth during the growing phase. And uh, when does menarche happen in girls? In which breast age? Yeah, right. So B3 to B4, children can develop menses. Okay, so going on to the next question. Uh, just one second. Uh, there is a small background noise. Can you check uh, Sondra? from your side. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So this Go is ahead. from the Nelson textbook. So all of you uh, must be aware. So I've just underlined the main points which I have already told you. So in B2, there will be papillary elevation. And uh, in B3, the breast uh, will elevate from the chest wall. And uh, P3, so I told you the hair will start to curl. And B4, there will be a secondary mound formation. And in penis, one important thing is the glands will appear like a pyramidal structure, which will be more prominent in the fourth stage. So some important points I've just underlined for you. So these are the answers. So we will be giving the handout to you. So I've just written the answers, what we have discussed. So going on to the next case. So this is an 18-month-old child noted to have breast development since the first month of life. And you can see that the length is normal. It is on the 50th centile only. And SMR, if you see, is B3, A1, P1. 
So you should notice that there is no growth, abnormal increase in height, and there is no pubic hair. Okay, so these two are important clues for you and the onset during the first year of life itself. That is also an important clue for you. So on lab investigations, you see that there is no pubertal enlargement of the uterus. So uterus is very small for age, appropriate for age. And ultrasound shows several microses. So these are all clues towards your diagnosis. So usually the breast development is because of the estradiol production from the ovary. So that estradiol production only leads to uterine enlargement also. But you see here the estradiol effect is there on the breast, but the estradiol effect is not there on the uterus. Okay, so there is some selective uh, uh, selectivity of the estradiol action. So that is made out in the question itself. And uh, bone age also, if you see, there is no bone age advancement. So the next clue, so there is no... A height increase, there is no bone age advancement and the L in the bloods, LH is prepubertal 0.1 and FSH is mildly elevated. So these are the clues you have got. So what's the diagnosis? So from the clues you have got, uh, can you make the diagnosis? So there is only selective enlargement of the breast tissue here. Any PGs know the answer? Yeah, it is premature thilak. Okay. So how will you, uh, and what is the etiology of this condition you think? Why is it happening? Actually, it is because of idiopathic hyperfunction of the pituitary ovarian axis. So actually we don't know for what reason the pituitary ovarian axis is getting stimulated, but it gets stimulated on an intermittent basis and very transiently estradiol production is there and there is selective uh, estrogen, I mean estrogen sensitivity is more in the breast tissue. That's why only the breast gets enlarged. So it is because of the idiopathic subtle hyperfunction of the pituitary ovarian axis. Okay, so how to differentiate from CPP? That is the most important thing because uh, CPP we need to uh, treat it differently. So you need to differentiate a premature tilak from a CPP. So how do you do that? Okay, so I told you from the clues itself. So in CPP, central precautious puberty, pubic hair development will be there. Here, pubic hair development is not there. And uh, in central precautious puberty, there will be a growth spot. So this child did not have a growth spot. This child did not have a bone age advancement. And the LH value also is prepubertal. In CPP, the LH value also will be increased like 0.3 or more. And ultrasound will show uterine uh, configure, the uterine configuration will be pubertal, that is about 3.5 centimeter will be the uterine length. So you have to see the uterine length. It will be more than 3.5 centimeter. That is pubertal uterus. And ovarian volume also will be more than 2 ml if it's pubertal. So the ovarian volume, the uterine length are more important in the ultrasound. And these several microcysts in ovary are there in the uh, premature tilar because of the increased FSH I told you, which stimulates the antral follicles. So these small follicles are seen as several microcysts in the ovary. So, uh, so going on to the next question. So what is the treatment for premature tilak? So what should you do if you diagnose premature tilak? Correct, reassurance. So you have to tell the parents that uh, this is a very self-limited condition. And they just need to come for regular follow-up because on very rare occasions, the uh, premature thilar can progress to central precocious puberty. So we need to keep the child under monitoring. But those, can, uh, those premature thilar which have onset in the infancy are mostly self-limited in 90% of the cases. Those premature thilar which happen later in the childhood, you have to be more cautious because they can progress to CPP on a higher risk okay so those children you have to be more cautious but for the diagnosis of premature tilaki there is no treatment you have to just keep them under follow-up and reassure the parents so the answers i've just put it for you okay so going on to the next question so this is a this is a six-year-old uh, girl uh, whose height is uh, Just a minute. 
Okay, so this is a six-year-old girl who has a, a height of 100 centimeters. So she is short for age. The height age is only four years and weight is 23 kg. So she, uh, her uh, weight falls between the 90 to 97 centimeters. So she is short and she is fat. And Thilark noted recently and Menark two days ago. So there is a very short uh, uh, tempo of progression of puberty. Usually the tempo of progression of puberty is two to three years from the time of breast development to menses. So here you are seeing like a mother says that just uh, Thilark appeared a few weeks back and then menses has appeared. So this is a very short history and bone age is 3.8 years, which is very much delayed. Significant delay is more than two years. So you have a very short child who is fat and who does not have the usual pubertal progression and who has a severe bone age delay. So these are the clues you have got. And on the graph, you can see that I have put a small triangle here. So this triangle denotes the bone age. Okay, so for the bone age, so how do you plot the bone age? So you have to drop a perpendicular from the uh, uh, height. So I have plotted the height at 100 centimeter for six years. So from that point, you have to draw a line to 3.8 years. So this line I've drawn, uh, like you have to draw a perpendicular from 3.8 years uh, to 100 centimeter. So that denotes the bone age. So now what is the diagnosis you're thinking of? So what are the causes of short and fat children? So short and fat children are mostly endocrine short stature. So the causes you know are hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency, uh, Cushing syndrome and pseudo hyperparathyroidism. So which of these can cause precocious puberty among these four, which do you think can cause precocious puberty? So that gives you the next question. So what blood test will cleanse the diagnosis? So what are you thinking as the diagnosis? Now what test do you want to order for this confirmation? Anybody? Yeah, hypothyroidism. That's correct. So you want to order a free T4 and TSH. Actually, the T3 has no role in hypothyroidism. We usually order a T3 when we are thinking of hyperthyroidism. So in hypothyroidism, we generally ask for a free T4 levels and TSH. And when we want to confirm that uh, uh, like free T4 can be ordered along with a total T4 and a TSH. Okay, no role for T3 here. So what's the diagnosis? So what is this condition called as hypothyroidism leading on to precocious puberty? There is a terminology for this condition. Does anybody know what is this condition? So this is called as Van Wyck Broomback syndrome. Okay, so I'll just explain uh, the basic funda of this. So we know this hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. So the TRH, that is a thyroid releasing hormone from the hypothalamus will act on the pituitary and release the thyroid stimulative hormone, TSH, which will act on our thyroid gland and release the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. So when normal amount of free T3 and T4 are there, it will cause a negative feedback mechanism and inhibit the TRH. Now we are telling that this child has hypothyroidism. So when the T4 and T3 levels are low, there will not be any negative feedback. So the negative feedback is gone. So what will happen? The TRH will be increased in the body. So next, what will happen? The TSH will increase in the body because the TRH is going to go and simulate the TSH. So what this TRH will do is TRH will, apart from increasing the TSH, will also increase the uh, secretion of prolactin because TRH controls, like increases both TSH and prolactin. So in this condition, you will also see a hyperprolactinemia. And this TSH, if you see, can also act on the gonadotropin receptors on the ovary. Okay, so it will stimulate the FSH receptors on the ovary and lead on to production of estriol. So this only leads to breast development. So I told you this estriol only is responsible for breast enlargement, uterine growth, and the endometrial uh, uh, thickness, which leads to menstrual bleeding. So all this can happen with only hypothyroidism without your gonadotropins becoming involved at all because this TSH is going and acting on the FSH receptor on the ovary. Okay, so why does the TSH go and act on the FSH receptor? How is it compatible? Because all the gonadotropins, that is FSH and LH and the TSH have a common alpha subunit. 
okay and only the beta subunit is unique to each hormone so because they have a similar alpha subunit the tsh is able to go and act on the fsh receptor on the ovary and hence leads on to this precocious puberty features okay okay so we'll just see the remaining questions so this is the basic funda of van wyck grumbach syndrome so uh, the remaining uh, questions are uh, so what's the diagnosis i told you it is van wyck grumbach syndrome what's the common etiology so hypothyroidism in this age what is the diagnosis like most probably what is the etiology for this hypothyroidism like in congenital hypothyroidism you have aplasia dysplasia ectopic like that in this age group what do you think is the diagnosis probably anybody okay so it is autoimmune hypothyroidism so most common cases in the pediatric age group are autoimmune so we have to order something called anti tpo anti thyroid peroxidase antibodies and anti thyroglobulin antibodies which will be very much elevated okay so you have to do these tests to confirm the etiology so is it gonadotropin dependent or gonadotropin independent so i showed you on the picture in the next slide so is it gdpp or gipp come on people i just explained <laughs> is the gonadotropin involved or not nobody is answering so was the lhfsh involved in that picture or not so the tsh was only going going and acting on the ovary and receptor no so the lh and fsh are not involved so it is gonadotropin independent okay so this is a cause of peripheral precocious puberty that is gonadotropin independent precocious puberty okay so what's the treatment so would you use some drugs to suppress the puberty here what would you like to treat the child with to stop the menses you want to use any other drugs why is nobody answering simple hypothyroidism no you should not use any estrogen inhibitors here yeah it is only thyroxin supplements okay when you correct the hypothyroidism the precocious puberty will settle okay so no need for any other drugs only thyroxin supplementation is enough and what surgical condition can be associated so sometimes these children will end up uh, with acute abdomen and uh, retrospectively they will see that uh, the child has hypothyroidism because when they are when the child has so much pain because of this condition there will not be any tachycardia there will be bradycardia so at that moment they will think of hypothyroidism so what surgical condition are we talking about so it is something in the abdomen so you can tell now what will happen in the abdomen acute abdomen anybody so i told you where the tsh is going and acting no so what acute abdomen will happen it is all there at the next slide i showed you so the tsh is going and acting yeah it is the ovarian cyst so big ovarian cyst can be there and it can cause ovarian torsion also that is the reason for the uh, ovarian i mean acute abdomen so what other hormone can be elevated so that also i explained to you so what other hormone no no i am asking what other hormones apart from thyroid and gonadotropins which will be elevated actually fsh will be suppressed fsh will not be elevated here it is gonadotropin independent so only your tsh will be high here t4 will be low what other hormone will be elevated i am asking you i showed you know trh will increase something else also apart from your tsh what will trh increase all of you are sleeping huh i just showed the picture trh will increase this hormone also apart from the tsh okay so it's prolactin uh, somebody has finally answered so it is prolactin okay so going on to the next question so hypothyroidism is something very important for all the post graduates okay going on to the next question uh, so this is a 5 year old girl with history of repetitive severe abdominal pain just like the previous case and has presented with acute abdomen ultrasound shows a right ovarian cyst volume of 13 ml with impending torsion on examination you have something interesting cefalo spots are there so you can see in the picture here and genu valgum is there so it is not hypothyroidism like the previous case so you you have a cefalo spot you have cefalo spots and genu valgum 
So you can see these cafe oleous spots on the chest, which are near to the midline. So from the midline, they are going to the right side. Okay, so that is one clue. Uh, and genovalgum is there, and there is uh, the child also has on examination B two, A one, P one, and M one. So mummy didn't reveal any history because child is in acute abdominal pain. But on examination, we found that child has very minimal thilat and also had a, a menstrual cycle just before this presentation. Okay, so we'll go on to the question. So what's the diagnosis? So the main clues are on your examination. Cephalus pods, genuvalgum, ovarian cysts. Yeah, somebody has answered correctly. It is McCune-Albright syndrome. So what's the triad of McCune-Albright? So these are all exam oscies for you. Very important ones. Yeah, precocious puberty is one. In the skeleton, what can happen? I put the X-ray here. What is this on the X-ray? So the triad is cephalic spots on the skin, precocious puberty which the child had, and fibrous dysplasia. So all three I have put it in the case. So fibrous dysplasia, cephalic spots, and precocious puberty. This is the triad of McCune-Albright. What other endocrinopathies can happen in McCune-Albright syndrome? Actually, hyperfunctioning of several uh, hormone glands can be there. So it can involve the growth hormone axis and it can cause acromegaly. It can cause hyperthyroidism. It can cause Cushing syndrome mainly in the infancy period. Uh, it can cause precocious puberty. And these fibrous dysplasias will produce something called FGF23, which will cause hypophosphatemic rickets. Okay, so these are the endocrinopathies which we see in McCune Albright syndrome. So, what is the genetic mutation here? So genetic mutation is, see, uh, there is something called G-protein coupled receptor. All of you know that, no? So there can be activating mutations of this GS alpha. So that leads to hyperfunctioning of several things. Okay, that's why we had uh, all these endocrinopathies which are hyperfunctioning. So it is uh, GNAS gene, G-N-A-S gene. So in that, there can be activating mutation of the GNAS gene. Okay, so how do you describe the cafe ole spot here? So I showed you a cafe ole spot. So the main differential for a cafe ole spot of McCune albright is neurofibromatosis. So how do you differentiate a neurofibromatosis cafe ole from a McCune albright cafe ole? Okay. So I showed you very clearly that it was touching the midline, you know, in this child. So McCune albright will mostly be in the midline, start from the midline and go to the side. So that is one clue, and it will have very jagged borders. Okay, that is called as post of main appearance. Whereas in neurofibromas, it will be not in the midline, it will be in the sides and it will have a smooth appearance that is called as post of California appearance. Okay, so what is the treatment of precocious puberty? Here we will use something called as a letrozole, which is the aromatase inhibitor. Okay, and question five, so what is this in the picture? Let's do this quickly. So this is a Prada's orchidometer. Okay, so what is it used for? Yeah, testicular volume estimation. So what does the number indicate on it? So you can see numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What are all these numbers? Yeah, it, it is in ML. Okay, so the testicular volume in ML. Okay, so 1 means 1 ML is the testicular volume. And how do you measure it? So I put a picture here. So you have to keep the bead, the beads just beside the testis. And you have to hold the testis pole to pole so that the extra fat tissue and all is not there, which will cause falsely increased size. So nicely squeeze the uh, uh, skin and the underlying fat and hold it end uh, pole to pole and compare it with the size of the beads and see what is the size of the testis. Okay. And what is the first sign of puberty in boys? Like in girls, we say thilar, no? For boys, what is the first sign? Yeah, it is gonadark. Okay. So increase in testis volume is called gonadark. And what testicular volume indicates mark of puberty, I mean, start of puberty? Yeah, 4 ml, that's right. Okay, so going on to question 6. So this is a 14 and a half year old boy brought with short penis. Okay, this is a common complaint. For, like parents are very much worried if the child has short penis. 
and height is 143 centimeters so you can see that the child at 14 and a half years is just below the third centile and weight is 35 kg that is also on the lower centile lines okay so child is looking like an undernourished child height and weight are both on the lower centiles and that lower centiles has been from the beginning okay so usually from two years itself they will be like this only always just running parallel to the lower centile lines so that malnutrition component is there in smr if you see child has a testicular volume of 5 ml okay and uh, p2 pubic hair stage 2 is there and is spl stretch penile length of 5 cm so this child has just entered puberty okay so the testicular volume is 5 ml and just pubic hair has started okay and so penile length is short only usually it is uh, from the testes that the testosterone will be released and it will act on the penis and penis should increase in length so it will take some time from the onset of puberty to the penis to increase in length okay because the child is just in stage 2 of uh, genital stage 2 that is testicular volume is just 5 ml the penis is yet to lengthen in size okay so this child is in early puberty with just few pubic hair and small penile length for age okay and dad is giving a characteristic history of shaving around 17 years so that is a uh, late bloomer we tell late bloomer so dad will tell that i was also remaining short for a long time and then when my uh, peers started to have mustache and beard i did not have later on i had a growth spurt when others had finished growing this dad will start to have a growth spurt and then he will have a delayed onset of mustache and beard and delayed shaving history so that is very characteristic late bloomer okay so that dad gave this history so what's the diagnosis yeah, it is CDGP. So Anurag sir has already told you this. I put it as early puberty, but you may see this child around 13 and a half years with just P1 and 3 ml testis. Okay. So this was a 14 and a half year old child. Usually average age of onset of puberty in boys is 12 years. So 12 years, they will enter into puberty. But this child early puberty is seen at 14 and a half years, which is because of the CDGP. Okay. So what will you expect in the bone age? So this also Anurag sir has covered. You will see a bone age delay approximately one to two years bone age delay will be there and what is the treatment so this child has already entered puberty you should know that this is not the same case that, that anurag sir had put with who's pre-pubertal this child has come for short penis but just has entered puberty so what would you want to do in this case yeah wait and watch because child has already entered puberty i would like to wait and watch uh, see the pubertal progression and then decide Suppose a child had presented a year earlier, like at 13 and a half or 14 years with pre-pubertal testes of 3 ml and P1, I would think it is CDGP and give three shots of testosterone and wait for some time and re-measure the testosterone and see. Okay, that sir has already explained, so we will go to the next case. So this is question number seven. A 14-year-old boy brought with complaints of prominence of breast tissue. Okay, and SMR is A2, P3 and testes is 6 ml bilateral. So this, uh, this boy is also in early puberty. 6 ml is only is the testicular volume and he, he has gynecomastia. Okay. So the close differential for uh, gynecomastia is lipomastia. So how will you differentiate a gynecomastia from lipomastia? So you always make the child uh, lie supine, put his hands behind the head and rest, uh, relax. And then with your uh, uh, thumb and forefinger, just palpate underneath the areolar complex. If you can feel a firm, rubbery, concentric, uh, disc-like thing under the areolar complex, then it is the glandular tissue of the breast. If nothing like that is there, then this is lipomastia. Okay? So a rubbery, firm, disc-like structure should be felt just below the areolar complex. Okay, then it is glandular tissue, that is gynecomastia. If nothing of that sort is there and child is obese, it might just be a lipomastia. Okay, so in that case, you will just advise weight loss. So this was a characteristic gynecomastia. So what test would you like to do here? So... Uh, so basically, you should understand that gynecomastia is, is because of increase in, uh, there is an imbalance between the testosterone and the estradiol levels in the blood. Okay, that is the reason for uh, gynecomastia. So little estrogen is more compared to the testosterone. In early puberty, usually there will be this imbalance, but as the puberty progresses, the testosterone will increase in the body and inhibit the uh, breast tissue. Okay, so because the child is in early puberty, because of this imbalance, gynecomastia can be seen in many children. 
Okay, so I would like to do some basic blood tests and see if it is normal or not. So the basic blood test will be free T4 TSH uh, uh, liver test because any liver condition also will inhibit the metabolism of the androgens and increase the conversion to estriol. So in uh, LFT will be done, creatinine will be done. Any chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, uh, hyperthyroidism, and uh, if any hypogonadism is there or estrogen secreting. Uh, tumors or aromatase excess, something like that. So when the testosterone is low or the estrogen is high, this can lead to gynecomastia. So you have to think of conditions where testosterone is low and estrogen is high. So do the test accordingly. And uh, if the tests come normal, uh, then what will you think of? So the testosterone is uh, pubertal range, LH is pubertal range, and other tests are normal, you will think of pubertal gynecomastia. And I told you what is the reason for breast tissue development. So the treatment here, uh, basically pubertal gynecomastia, we will just reassure them and we will tell it is a self-limiting condition. Within one to two years, it will generally settle. So just wait and watch. And uh, the basic thing I've just put here, which we will give in the handout because of lack of time, I'm just skipping this. How is estriol being produced in boys? And so these are the causes of high estrogen and low testosterone in the boys. So you can just go through all this. So we'll go on to the final question. In two minutes, I'll finish it, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So this is an 18-month-old toddler whose length is above the 97 centile, 92 centimeter. So we expect one and a half year old child, 92 centimeter. So he's uh, tall for age and rapid increase in penile length and frequent erections from 10 months of age. Okay. And SMR is A1, P2, and penile length is increased 7.5 centimeter. But the tests are prepubertal, 3 cc and 2 cc only. Okay, so there is a prepubertal test with a long penis and pubic hair, and bone age is advanced. So height is advanced, bone age is advanced. So there is some androgen source here, but not from the testes because testes is not enlarged, so it is not coming from the testes. So what is the diagnosis? So diagnosis is uh, gonadotropin independent precocious puberty here. Okay, so that has only led to the increase in penile length. And pubic hair. So, what are the causes in boys? As a postgraduate, the most important thing you should remember is CAH. So, a simple virilizing CAH can usually present between three to four years of age. But this child at one and a half years was quite early, and this child actually had an adenocortical tumor. So, usually testicular tumors, adrenal tumors, CAH, and hypothyroidism mechanical can cause this. So, first line investigations you should just remember for CAH. So, CAH basically we do uh, 17 hydroxy progesterone. Uh, DHEAS, testosterone, cortisol, sodium, potassium, and glucose. So just remember this, other causes, adrenal and testis, so you have to do ultrasound abdomen, ultrasound of the testis. Uh, so this I've just explained, no? prepubertal testis with increased penile length, no gonadarch is there, so it is GIPP. So these are the answers. So if there is any query, I'll answer it later on. So we'll proceed to the next session. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Soundaram. Uh, she has prepared for the last three to four days, day and night. Very excellent uh, question answer session and very ideal. Thank you very much, Dr. Soundaram. Now I request uh, next uh, presenter, Dr. Lena, to present the case of precocious puberty. For this, examiner will be Dr. Anna Simon, Professor of uh, Pediatrics and Pediatric Endocrinology from CMC Bello. Madam is a very good examiner, teacher, author for textbooks, and internationally known faculty. Over to you, madam. Thank you. Soundaram, you stop the screen, no? Oh, uh, stop sharing. Yeah, stop sorry. sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Lena, please. Yes, sir. Dr. Lena is a student uh, from Apollo Chennai, uh, student of Dr. Soundra. Yeah. So, is my screen visible, sir? Yes, yes. And am I audible? Yes, audible. Okay. Good evening, all. I'm uh, Dr. Lena from Apollo Children's Hospital. And uh, my mentor is Dr. Soundra. And Dr. Yoga will be helping me out with the questions posted later. So I'm going to present a case on central precocious puberty. So we had an eight-year, eight-month-old girl who was brought to us in the month of February 2021. 
and uh, she came with complaints of rapid increase in height for one year and for six months she had uh, increase in breast development and for three to four months she had uh, axillary and pubic hair development. She had also attained menarche uh, before 10 days. So the both breasts were equal in size and slowly growing in the last six months. She also had complaints of pain when touching the breast or initially in the two months, which then subsided on its own. And the hair development, that is the axillary and pubic hair, last, for the last three to four months, it was found to be thick and bushy. She also had white discharge for a month before menses. And Menak was uh, uh, attained 10 days ago, and it was characterized by spotting only for two days. And she used only one pad per day, and there was no history of dysmenorrhea. So the child was uh, always one among the tallest in the class. However, now uh, it was noticed that she was much taller than the rest of the class. And the family members also noticed that uh, the dresses which were brought last year were, were not fitting the child anymore. And all these features were not seen like headache, vomiting, visual disturbances, and no use of tea tree oil, lavender oil use, and no use of cosmetics, no history of uh, head trauma. So the treatment history, the child was diagnosed to have early uh, puberty and started on injections in March, 2021. Initially it was given once in four weeks for the first two doses and then once in 12 weeks. She also received vitamin D supplements along with that. And after the start of treatment, uh, she had one menstrual cycle two weeks after the first dose and it lasted for five to six days with normal flow. And it was also pain-free and uh, like the patient did not have any dysmenorrhea and thereafter no further menses. Uh, can I just interrupt at this moment? Uh, if you go back to your history, uh, the progression of the puberty has been so fast. I'm not sure whether I'm uh, commenting because I don't know because you have seen the patient. You will think it's possible. But you said that there was high tax duration for the first one year, one year. And then tilarchy started six months back and menarche within six months of tilarchy. That is not yes. the usual physiological kind of puberty progress. Do you have any explanation for that? Normally, girls normally can achieve tilarchy after eight years. And after one and a half to two years of tilarchy, you develop menarche. And height yes. accretion occurs in stage two, Tanner. Okay, it's, uh, so I mean, your patient has some features which are very atypical because there is a high expression for one year, breast development over the last six months, and menarche within six months of breast development. Yes, ma'am, it was the rapid. tempo of the pubertal progress is not very typical. Uh, do you have any explanation for that? No, ma'am, she presented like this only, ma'am. Uh... It was a rapid progression. The tempo, the normal tempo, was not found in this child. Uh, Doctor Sandram, please help her. So actually, history was little modified, madam, uh, about the height and all. Doctor Sandram, please uh, help. Actually, I felt that maybe the parents did not appreciate the breast development early on. They noted it only after yeah. it was quite uh, significant. That's why we have to give uh, leading questions to the parents to find out the exact sequence because the tempo of progress of puberty also has. Uh, some relevance with regard to the prognosis and the cause of this precocious puberty. Then the other comment I wanted to make was, when you say treatment history, it is a treatment prior to what has happened. You have given the management of this patient as treatment history. Am I right? Yes, so yes, the treatment history is the treatment happening prior to this, which has an implication on the diagnosis. This is the child's management which happened after you made the diagnosis. This is not treatment history. Okay. This is the comment that I have to tell you. This is actually the management which followed yeah. your diagnosis. Yes, ma'am. So, yeah. So, that, that I think has to be uh, noted very well. When we say treatment history, it's a treatment which happened during the course of the illness or preceding this illness, which has contributed to the development or may have not contributed. This is the management of this case. Yes, ma'am. Right. I'll proceed, ma'am. 
Yeah, uh, just a second, Lena. Just go back and uh, you tell us why you asked all those negative history. Please. Uh, headache, vomiting, visual disturbances. Uh, to rule out any intracranial space occupying lesions, sir. And uh, the tea tree oil, lavender oil, uh, they uh, they seem to possess some estradiol like actions. So uh, the that negative history was asked because of that. And uh, cosmetic use. Uh, some cosmetics, uh, they do contain uh, some chemicals which tend to increase the rate at which the puberty is attained. And also head trauma is uh, uh, known to cause early puberty. So I would like to add here that the use of soya products, soya milk, soya chunks, soya oil, oil do give in phytoestrogens, which can actually lead to breast development. And uh, that's one question that you can ask. What yes. specific history you want to ask if child is male? Uh, the child is male, sir. Yeah. The intracranial space occupying lesions are more common. That you told us. something extra. Not in female, but males. Male, but sorry. Yeah. Yes, sir. Something to do with the behavior. Behavior. Laughing. In the prep. Yes, very good. Yeah. Go ahead. So past history, there was nothing significant found and no prior hospitalization history. And uh, she was uh, no, uh, born by normal vaginal delivery. Birth weight was 2.7 kg and she was an adopted child. The biological family details are not available. So she was uh, appropriate for age developmental wise and also her scholastic performance was found to be good. And uh, the as far as the diet history is concerned, she is uh, on vegetarian diet and uh, the calorie intake was 1,620 kilocalories uh, uh, which she had but the required was uh, 1800 and there is a deficit of 180 kilocalories and protein in protein intake was 22 grams and the required was 35 and the deficit of uh, 13 grams was noted and according to modified kupuswami scale uh, she belongs to upper class family so to summarize we have an eight year, eight month old girl with early onset breast development, pubic and axillary hair growth, rapid progression and had menarche within six months. Growth spurt was present, no symptoms of raised ICT and not uh, SGA at birth. So the comment I have is that uh, you on a, on a calorie and protein deficit diet, she had very good height acceleration. I think the dietary history should be taken more carefully. According to what you said, it's a calorie deficit, protein deficit. And as you all know, puberty usually is an, uh, happens when there's an energy excess, fed state, a certain BMI, is known to be necessary for stimulating the puberty onset. So that history I probably will have to be redone, whether there was a real calorie deficit and protein deficit in the diet. doesn't go well with the presentation. Yes, ma'am. I'll proceed now. Yes, proceed. So the provisional diagnosis of precocious puberty is made. So for physical examination, child was alert, active, and vitals were all stable, and no pallor, ictris, cyanosis, clubbing, or lymphadenopathy or pedal edema was found. There was no goiter, no cafe au lait spots, and no abnormality of the limbs. So her height was 145.2 centimeter, which was found to be in the 97th centile. Just a second, uh, Lena. Yes. Gender physical examination, if you're thinking of uh, intracranial space of occupying region, you have to examine something you're missing here. What is it? The head circumference. Sir. What is um, Something in the okay. eyes. Something in the eyes. Lady yes. 
So BMI was in was uh, 17.03. Her weight age was 11 years, three months. Height age, 11 years, three months. And chronological age of eight years, eight months. So the height age and weight age were found to be more than the chronological age. So systemic examination was found to be normal. Uh, there is no abnormalities detected. So to summarize, eight year, eight month old girl with early onset breast development, pubic and axillary hair growth, rapid progression to menarc and presence of growth spurt, no symptoms of raised ICT. And on examination, SMR was A2, P3, B4, M1. Vaginal mucosa was pink and pale and no mass was palpable per abdomen. And so provisional comment here, when you are looking at the eye, of course, we have to look for signs of papilledema and you often get symptoms of raised ICT. But what is often missed with uh, most of the central tumors are of defect in the field of vision. So mm -hmm. confrontation technique and field of vision is also some important sign when we are looking for, uh, when we are examining these cases. Yes, ma'am. I'll proceed, ma'am. Yes. So provisional diagnosis of precocious puberty. Let me ask you one question at that moment. Yes. Given that you have got this history, mm -hmm. uh, do you think this is central precocious puberty or is it a peripheral precocious puberty? Basically, whenever we assess a child with precocious puberty, the first question is, is it precocious? Yes. The second mm -hmm. question is, is it central precocious puberty or is it peripheral precocious puberty? I think it is central, ma'am. Yes. Why? Uh, because uh, in uh, there are no signs of uh, any uh, abdominal mass or... Uh... No, no, no. More, more important than that. It has all the components of puberty. All right? Yeah. So that's very important. Most of the time... Also isosexual. Isosexual and most of the components of puberty would be present. So this yes. more looks like a central precocious puberty. Yes, ma'am. Yes, go on. So the investigation... Uh, just one second. Uh, Lena, can you tell the normal sequence of uh, puberty in females? What is the normal sequence? Uh, including first, growth spurt. Yeah. We have uh, Telarx, sir. Very good. And then we have the pubic axillary hair growth. What is that called? Chubark. Yeah. Chubark. Yeah. Growth spurts. Sir. Yeah. Men uh, menstruations. Yeah. Go ahead. So hormonal profile was tested. LH was found to be 5.2, FSH 5.3, estradiol 40. What is your interpretation of that? Basal, is it basal? Basal values of LH, FSH and estradiol. Yes. What is your interpretation? Uh, it, LH, uh, FSH uh, is found to be raised, ma'am. Yeah, so you what's your interpretation of that? Yes. Pubertal. Does it, does it confirm something? Which you clinically Gon on examination a, decided? Does it confirm? It's a con it's a gonadotropin independent precocious. Good. So it's a true precocious puberty. Gonadotropin dependent precocious puberty. Yes, ma'am. So free T4 was 0. 0.8, TSH 1.16, and prolactin was 5.6. So bone age was uh, uh, 12.4 according to uh, TW3 and 13.4 according to TW2. So ultrasound abdomen was done. Uterine dimensions were... Just go back. Just go back. Uh, you tell how much is the bone age advancement. You need to tell here. What is the normal bone age advancement and in your case how much? What is this sir? I, I didn't get the question. What is the chronological age of this child? Chronological age is eight years, eight months, sir. Yeah, you tell how much is advanced, how many years? What is the normal advancement? Do you know what is the normal advancement during puberty or during even normal for the age? Standard deviation. Two standard deviations. Yeah. Ten percent of the age. Suppose child is ten years, so plus or minus one year. So up to one, one year advancement is normal. So here, how many years? Four years, four, yes. five years. Yes, 
So the uterine dimensions were found to be 5.9 into 3.8 into 3.1 centimeter, and the thickness of endometrium was 8 millimeters, and both ovaries measured 11 ml, and uh, it had multicystic appearance, but there was no evidence of any mass lesion. So this is the MRI brain which was done and it was found to be normal. So the diagnosis is made to be idiopathic central precocious puberty. So the management. So injection loop. Just a second, one question here. Uh, when you will think of organic lesion, in which conditions you will think uh, puberty is due to organic? Uh, when there is an accelerated precocious puberty, we should definitely think about the organic process. So. What else? Which sex? Male and or female? In males. Or um, females. Male. Below what age? Six Below years. Six years. Very good. And signs of intracranial tension. Very yes. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. So, management. Injection leucrolyte acetate was given. Uh, 3.75 mg deep IM was given for two doses, four weeks apart. And vitamin D, 60,000 IU, one sachet every alternate month was given. So during the follow-up in April 2021, estradiol value was found to be 11 and LH was found to be 4.9. Hence, leucrolyte was switched to 7.5 mg IM followed by uh, 22.5 mg IM once in 12 weeks. Why was a stimulated LH done on treatment with GNR? Actually, the child was already undergoing treatment and uh, that uh, treatment dose was taken as the stimulus and uh, LH was measured after that. Ma'am, actually, we did not give any decapeptyl here, ma'am. The lupulite dose, which was due, the same lupulite dose we gave, and two hours after the lupulite uh, treatment dose, we would check the LH. What was that meant for? You had already okay. made a diagnosis of central. Yes, ma'am, but was that 3.75 mg adequate to control uh, uh, the uh, pubertal features? We wanted to check because mom was uh, telling that the breast development was little. Uh, increasing. So, to check that, I had done this stimulated LH value with the treatment dose itself. So, it came high. So, we switched from 3.75 to 7.5 mg. Treatment failure. You are considering a treatment failure and you wanted to redo the GNR channel of right? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? I think we had extensive. Uh... Yes, madam. Uh, I think madam has some net issues. So usually when we give GNR a channel log, there will be initially stimulation followed by there will be suppression. So after giving injection of GNRH, we are checking after two hours for suppression. But suppression will take some time, means at least after two injections only there will be suppression. Actually, so this, they should, was, yeah. this was done after the second dose only, so when she was uh, due for the third dose, we had done this. Okay. First dose she had menses, we did not do anything, we knew that there will be a flare. After the yeah. second dose also, there was some progression in the breast development, that was a concern. So when we are giving the third dose, this stimulated value was done actually, when we gave that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, a small question to Lena. Can yes, you tell sir. about the what is GNR stimulation test and when you want to do? Uh, GNR stimulation test, we give uh, GNRH and then we measure the uh, hormone values, sir. Yes, so very good. We, we do it uh, to diagnose and also to see whether the treatment, whether there is any treatment failure or not. What are the indications when you want to do? So can I take this question, sir? Yes, please. Yes. Um, when we are suspecting central precautions, but if the LH levels are normal, then when you then we go in for the GNRH stimulation. 
Apart from that, any other condition mimicking like uh, precautious puberty? You have discussed so many cases, no? Premature tilarki, uh, whether it's a progressing or not, it's very important. Raghupati, sir, uh, sir, you have any questions? Madam is not there. Uh, I just wanted to say one technique which the examinees can follow, not only in endocrinology, in every other subject also. It is, in this case, for example, if we had said two central hypersexual precocious puberty, it impresses the examiner. I, I can tell you that. At least I will be impressed. And then what will I do? Why do you say two? Why do you say central? Why do you say isosexual? And you go ready with the answers. And uh, you can score more marks. And you can be very impressive also. After all, we are uh, not saying anything out of the way. That is the diagnosis. And it's also one of the ways to learn all the components. It is a true precursor. Then they will say, what are the causes? Pseudo puberty. So you can be prepared with the answers and you can lead the examiner to ask you the questions which you want. Otherwise, they will ask you some other question. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay, that's a very uh, you know clever way of leading the examiner. Okay. Yes, sir. I just wanted to mention that. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Yeah, Madam is coming back. She called just one or two minutes. Sir, you have any questions, sir? No, I'm uh, quite happy with what she has said. Yeah. Uh, there is one question in the chat box about 22.5 being given six monthly. It is acted only for three months. So it is given for 12 weeks and uh, six months, no. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Divya, you have any questions? Uh, please ask. Madam will be joining uh, shortly. Hello, sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam. Please over to you. Okay. Uh, just a minute, let me share my slides. Okay. Lena, I think you have stopped sharing. I stopped, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes, madam. We are able to see, madam. Okay. So, I think uh, lots have been said and I, all of you are uh, fully knowledgeable by now. We quickly go through precocious puberty. But the main challenges which when we deal with precocious puberty is like identifying children with pathological forms or whether they are, they are different normal variants of pubertal development. And that is the most important thing, like how we went through the first case, the, case, the previous case, and to decide whether the central precocious puberty or peripheral precocious puberty or whether they are a normal variant. That is the first step in the challenge on, in managing precocious puberty. We definitely have to know whether it is central, gonadotropin dependent or gonadotropin independent because that's very crucial for planning appropriate investigations and treatment. So it's important to know something about normal puberty, which I think is going to bore everyone now because we are at the end of the session and the sequence. So you, all of you know what puberty is. I'm not going to go through it. And puberty, or, uh, puberty is actually starts from activation and maturation of the HPG axis. Simultaneously, there is maturation of the adrenal cortex also. So it's a process where there is a physical maturation and an adolescent reaches sexual maturity and he becomes capable of reproduction. Usually it starts between 8 and 13 in girls and 9 and 14 in boys. And you can see there are a lot of emotional and hormonal changes along with the physical changes like increase in height and weight, telarchy, which is breast development, pubarchy, and genital changes in boys with voice changes and menarchy. We don't have to go through that in detail. And all of you are aware that this starts from the pulsatile release of GnRH, 
from the hypothalamus and it happens with an energy energy sufficiency or excess state and with the uh, with the role of kiss peptin and gnrh thereby acts on the pituitary gland producing the gonadotropins fsh and lh and they all have a feedback mechanism also and lh and fsh act on the gonads producing the sex hormones so we can skip that and these sex hormones make the changes in the physical and emotional uh, uh, changes that happen in the boy or the girl leading on to pubertal development there are variations of normal pubertal de development the most common is premature pilarchy and premature adrenarchy these conditions do not require any treatment like i said before and only reassurance and a follow up of every 3 to 6 months so premature pilarchy is i think this is all been said but i just want to reiterate that it's self limited not associated with any high accelerations can be unilateral bilateral and very young girls it can regress also and if you are very worried about whether it's just premature pilarchy or not a gnr stimulation test can help to differentiate whether it is uh, cpp or just premature pilarchy Premature pilarchy does not require treatment, but it mandates very close follow-up to know whether they don't rapidly progress to CPP. Premature adrenarchy happens more frequently in girls than in boys. We should differentiate the benign form from pathological forms. That is very important because premature adrenarchy, as a peripheral precocious property, most often they are pathological forms. So the benign premature adrenarchy. starts the bone age advancement won't be more than 2 years from the chronological age or it may even be equivalent to the high age and when you look at the serum levels of dhcs and testosterone they may be mildly elevated but it will be appropriate for the skeletal age and the most important thing is there is no sign of gonadal maturation either in boys or girls that is saying that the testicular size will remain the same though there are other changes of pubertal development and if you see clitoral hypertrophy or hirsutism in girls then it is definitely a pathological adrenarchy so this is how the height progression happens as you all know this chart just shows that the height acceleration occurs in the early phase of pubertal development in girls whereas in boys it happens in the tan of 4 to 5 stage and that information is relevant to us when we take history so we know at what uh, stage of pubertal development the child is so when we call precocious puberty if puberty happens before 8 years in girls or before 9 years in boys then it is pubertal precocious puberty and it is very important to differentiate whether it is isosexual precocious puberty or heterosexual precocious puberty heterosexual precocious puberty is always pathological isosexual precocious puberty can be differentiated again into gonadotropin independent or gonadotropin independent as we have gone through before so the questions we ask is is it precocious is the child too young to have reached this milestone what is the cause of this are there other signs attributable to androgen or estrogen and what is the source of this sex hormones where is it coming from is it physiological or pathological and how far advanced the puberty is and how rapidly it is progressing so these two aspects are very important when we decide on the management of these children and of course we have to ask ourselves is treatment really indicated so when we look at gonadotropin dependent precocious puberty it's otherwise called true precocious puberty or central precocious puberty that's premature activation of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis and most of 90% of precocious puberty is actually gonadotropin true precocious puberty where you have gonadarchy and plus and uh, most of the time adrenarchy progressing along with the uh, uh, gonadarchy and idiopathic causes are the most common especially in females you can see that the ratio is 10 is to 1 and if it is closer to the normal age of development like closer to 8 then it's most likely just a early normal physiological puberty and we don't have to elaborately do mri mri would be considered if the child is less than 6 year old and has other or there has other problems uh, denoting cns abnormalities and uh, as said before apart from cns abnormalities we should also look at the familial causes where puberty can be early or it can be if a gonadotropin independent puberty which was 
uh, not managed well or treated like example in CH, you may have uh, cerebral uh, CPP developing in a monotropin independent pupil. So that aspect also should be considered. Investigations, as we all see now, we look at the growth velocity and the bone age. It's very important. Sometimes if you have multiple pituitary hormone deficiencies, growth hormone deficiency may mask the pubertal growth spurt. So high transmission may not be seen when you have multiple pituitary hormone defect. Basal LH, FSH, eastern IR or testosterone will help you to differentiate whether it is uh, CPP or peripheral precocity. Rarely, you may have to do a GNR stimulation test to make the distinction. MRI brain and pituitary should be done only where when it is indicated. So here is a child with a hypothalamic hematoma, as you can see, and this child had a presented with precocious puberty at two years of age, with all the full components of precocious puberty. So CNS tumors are common in younger children, and uh, if there are signs of CNS involvement, we have to carefully uh, uh, do an MRI scan and make the diagnosis. And the treatment considered, it will depend on the cause, a treatment should be considered with GNRH analogs if definitely if the final height is compromised. And depending on the tempo of progression of puberty, if the progression of puberty is very fast or the child is unable to cope emotionally and socially with the puberty. As you said, if it's a primary cause, the tumor has to be uh, addressed or GNRH agonist, as we said before, or a 12 weekly depot injections to, sub, uh, to suppress the uh, gonadotropin, hypothalamic, uh, pituitary gonadal axis. Gonadotropin independent precocious puberty, it comes from exogenous sex steroids, or it can be from tumors from the adrenal gland, gonadal gland, most common, and rarely hypothyroidism, as was said just now, that's a rare cause of, or an unusual cause of gonadotropin independent precocious puberty, secondary to high levels of TRH and TSH levels, and the similarity of the um, alpha subunits. So the causes of gonadotropin independent puberty, there can also be autonomous ovarian function like we saw in the mccune albright syndrome or other ovarian tumors or in the testis, testicular or germ cell tumors or activating mutation of genes for the LH receptor, right, for male limited gonadotropin uh, independent puberty like testotoxicosis or mccune albright syndrome in the boy also. So here the investigations may be different Depending on the cause of the peripheral precocious puberty, we may do different causes. We may decide to do a DHS, adrenal steroids, like 17 OHPA DHS, or an ultrasound of the adrenal or gonads, HCG and alpha uh, fetal protein as tumor markers also may have to be done if you are dealing with the peripheral precocious puberty. And the treatment of peripheral precocious puberty is highly individualized and managed accordingly based on the etiology, the predicted adult height and other psychological concerns. So I just wanted to show you the same skin lesion, cafe or lay spots. Of course, somebody showed a McCune Albright earlier, but here is a child who came with NF1, neurofibromatosis, and he had central precocious puberty to an aptic glioma, which was impinging very near the hypothalamic area. So that's also possible. The same way, again, another McCune Albright spot, the ragged main of coast, coast of main appearance, and fibrous dysplasia, McCune Albright syndrome. So, what I would like to uh, reiterate here, points to remember us first thing is we have to distinguish precocious puberty from normal variants of pubertal development. Secondly, we have to distinguish whether it's central precocious puberty or peripheral precocious puberty because the investigations and management will uh, change according to what it is and our planning of those investigations. Uh, can be done ideally only after distinguishing whether it is CPP or whether it is a peripheral precocious puberty. Unnecessary investigations should be avoided. The features of precocious puberty are inconsistent or not clearly evident, and we can follow up the patient after a few months for reassessment. Reassessing the patient at every intervals of four to six months may help you to come to a conclusion in which direction we have to uh, uh, investigate. Suppression of true precocious puberty with GNRH analogs should be considered if there is significant compromise to adult's nature and there are other behavioral issues secondary to early pubertal development. Otherwise, we may not have to treat if the height is not compromised and the family is able to cope with it. With this, uh, I will end my talk.
thank you very much madam uh, in spite of uh, madam busy schedule and um, we hope uh, madam's mother is well and uh, she will recover good uh, we thank all the participants examiners examinees and professors and uh, dr shaila bhattacharya and all the students who had made uh, this pp an excellent session especially dr saundaram uh, presenting the oskis and anurag sir madam giving a very excellent lectures over to ragupati sir uh, congratulations samarna for another successful pp program and i hope everybody liked it and as you said uh, the very first case was a, a good eye opener for most of the postgraduate attending and the pranurag simplified the approach to this and uh, sondaram had emphasized all the practical points which they should know during uh, the nosti exam uh, that was quite good and uh, Lina's presentation also was very nice, appropriate case, and Dr. Anna gave you so many points to remember and to distinguish physiology from pathology. And uh, I'm very pleased that we had another successful session. Thanks to Amanda. Thanks to all the participants, the panelists, and the faculty. Thank you very much. Yeah, I especially thank Raghupati sir. He's always a, a student friendly. When I used to be a student, and even for all postgraduate, used to take the cases from the OPD and uh, go to the general pediatrics department and say, "So what we need uh, present day is blessings of our teacher and skills rather than the knowledge. So we need to get the skills from the teacher. More than that, love and affection of a teacher is very important nowadays." and even love and affection towards the patient uh, those are the real blessings of uh, the knowledge and the uh, the doctor patient relationship madam yes, one or two one or two words from the anna simon madam yeah thank you dr lagupati sir um, and uh, is been a great example nice to see you and uh, nice to participate in this session with you thank you very much and dr soundaram you had an excellent collection of oskis I think you covered the whole of puberty with your Oscars. That was nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And Amarnath, thank you very much for your wonderful work. Yes. We thank our ex event people uh, and the mainly uh, Shaila Madam for giving this platform. And we'll be coming in next uh, October session with very interesting topic: acanthoplasia and uh, uh, other uh, interesting cases. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, do you, want, do you want to ask for any feedback from the attendees? Yes, so sir. Yes. They could uh, send uh, some feedback so that will help us to plan future sessions also, and they can say whether it was useful. I mean, they can be open about it, and uh, that's the whole idea. And if you don't want to mention your name, okay, fine. But we would like. It. Active comments, whether you liked it, whether you wanted some other aspect to be emphasized, uh, whether it was too much, too little, or to the point, things like that. So, I yeah, to get some feedback from the attendees. Yes, anyone? Just I need a five seconds, sir, to cover the questions. Just uh, five seconds. Uh, you can, you can uh, write to us by yeah. email also. Yeah, just last uh, one slide, five seconds. These are the questions. Uh, theory questions are coming from the uh, puberty topic. Already you know most of the things covered. Physiology of puberty, normal physiology. They are asking diagnostic approach to precocious puberty, premature thalarchy, investigation management of delayed puberty. Once they asked about the virilization, so please note this extra question. Define and classify precocious puberty. Outline diagnostic approach. Uh, 14 years old boy with infantile. genetalia so these are the question thank you very much uh, we are, we want the feedback 
I think Lina, you can tell, or even Yogavali. Yes. Yes, sir. Actually, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Amarnath and also Dr. Raghupati for giving this wonderful opportunity. And even if I had read my books uh, 10 to 15 times, I wouldn't have got such an experience. It was really great to do this presentation with you guys as my examinees, examiners. Sorry. And uh, also, I'd like to thank Dr. Soundaram for uh, giving me this opportunity and selecting me from uh, our institution. And also, I like Dr. Naga Gita's presentation. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, Yogovalli, you want to say something? Uh, yes, sir. Very sorry for the bad throat I have. Um, yeah, this was really a useful presentation, sir. Especially like uh, the OSCEs were very useful. And both the presentations were really good. It was very useful. And um, and uh, regarding this endocrine, mostly like we go like I mean we don't, we are sometimes like clueless like how to proceed all, but uh, this definitely showed us an excellent protocol for like how to proceed. And um, Dr. Soundram definitely she guides us in our uh, clinical aspects in all our uh, uh, cases what we receive. And this was really useful, and we'll definitely apply this in our like cases like which we get in the future, sir. So. Thank you so much for the opportunity, sir, and everyone. Thank you. You had uh, you had the photographic evidence of how Sandram is being helped by her son actively, so <laughs> she could do so well. Yeah, very energetic and dynamic, sir. She is. I'm just joking. We enjoyed yeah. the positive <laughs> session, uh, Sandram. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, we pray for the long age and uh, more blessings of Raghupati sir towards us. He is one of the first pediatric endocrinologist uh, of India and one of the first professors. So we like you sir. Uh, we need your blessings for all your student community in future. We need you and your uh, blessings and love. More than that love. Sir is always loving. So he cancelled all his uh, Appointments today. It will be all the blessings will be raining as the monsoon today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, with this, uh, we'll end the session. Wishing you all the best for your exams. You will. Uh, we pray that you all will become professors and teachers and other for textbooks. Please opt pediatric endocrinology after your MD pediatrics or the NB pediatrics. Very interesting and learning uh, subject and more satisfaction giving branch than any other super thank you thank you sir thank you so much sir yeah. good night. thank you sir good night sir thank you well done. thank you sir. thank you well done. bye thank you sir